Yo, it's a full house today. It's actually pretty impressive how many people are uh, here to get us started off. I think everybody got really excited by the first real dose of volatility we've had since, let's say, I don't know, last October. Um, like a lot of volatility really quick. VIX up by 70%. Uh, trough Stop peak. it. Stop. Time out. No, but people are excited by this. People love this shit. We don't do that here. VIX 70%. It's not like 22. The VIX made a large move higher. Hey, uh, let's say hi to Adam Kaufman, Joel Dunlap, Dave Edwards, Trenton Thielen, 76 Chandler, Phil Sheridan, Dan McIntyre, and so many other ladies have joined us us tonight for the live version of What Are Your Thoughts? And we appreciate you guys. Duncan Hive is activated. I'm seeing bumblebees all over my feed. Ian Dunlop's in the house. That's my boy right there. A uh, lot of people. I don't want to spend too much time on this. It drives Same. Mike absolutely bonkers, <laughs> but I do want to shout you guys out for making the premiere. It's really sick. We love it. Um, what else is going on? Oh, Duncan has viewer topics tonight, and if you like sending us those topics or you haven't yet, make sure to do that. Ask the compound show at Gmail. Dot com. Let's put up Y charts. Shout out to the best sponsor in the world. We love Y charts. You always see uh, dozens and dozens of Y charts uh, charts on our Billions. content each week on the blogs, on the video. We do a lot of stuff behind the scenes with their data too. Thank you, Y charts. All right, let's get right into it. First thing I want to talk about: um, Can everybody just calm the f down for like thirty seconds? We no, you finally can't. got a little. You can't. You're, you're pouring gasoline on the fire, quoting 70% moves in the VIX. Get out of here. You should have heard me on uh, TV today. I was like, I'm embarrassed for all of for all of you, sir. I thought uh, there was a lot of hysterical commentary in my email box. I'm not really active on social media as much, and I don't watch TV. But I got a ton of, like, bears coming out of the woodwork. Like, this is just the beginning. So, of course... We're could up be. five, six hundred points. It could be, but it's not. We don't know that for sure. Uh, at its worst, how much was the S and P five hundred down from its record high? Four percent, three point six, three point six percent drawdown. Um, it's been pointed out though that there are a lot of stocks that have just been absolutely rocked. When is that not the case? Right, isn't right, that always right, the case? Right, right. All right, what do you got for me on this? What do you mean? Uh, uh, all right, so so all right. Listen, I asked I, you for like thirty six charts. Ho- put one of them. I, I quibbled with Ben about this, saying, "Oh, the the index is only two point seven percent off its highs." Okay, but there are a lot of stocks that are getting absolutely mauled. Like it, people do own individual stocks. That's the thing that happens. Airlines killed a lot of industrial. All the reopening. Like I don't know if it's Delta variant or what it is. You know, pick your narrative. But some things are getting wrecked bigly. I think what you're telling me is that there are certain stocks that went up 100% that fell 10%. Stop. That, Come on. How much is Freeport McMoran up from the low so and then what? tell me how much it's off the high? We could, it we matters. Could do both. We, could, we could do both. Okay. It matters. I think it's up 400%. And then it fell 30%. Well, what do you, what do you expect? Like, Dude, I, some, But some people bought it 30% ago. Yeah. That's Not everybody bought it at the lows. That's unfortunate. Not everybody bought it at the highs either. And if you still like it and you're still in it, then you got a gift. Look, I think this was really interesting to me. The drawdown charts for cyclicals, travel and leisure stocks, transports, like all the reopen stuff um, is, I, th- I think, like on a stock-by-stock basis, you can find a lot of carnage. But on the surface, you really did get bailed out by the FANG names. They're way more important than any of those other stocks individually or even collectively. And they, they're almost acting – I hate saying this out loud. Do it. Do it. They have so much cash on their balance sheets that they're acting like uh, – Don't you say it, actually. They're acting like tre- treasuries. No, I knew but it. They, stop. Stop. But they stop. are, though. Just stop. Just stop. Wait, why, is Apple like correlate, why is Apple correlated with the, with, with the fucking 10-year treasury? I'm going to give you – I'm going to give – take oh. it back. Take it back. Oh, sorry. I'm not, not saying they like are bugs. like treasuries. I'm saying they act like treasuries. They kind of do in in this recent uh, bout of volatility. You know, like How that uh, Billy Madison, everyone is dumber. That's what just happened. <laughs> Apple's acting like a bod. I should I should have made that chart. It's acting okay. like a stock. No, no, but, but hold on. This is important. So, yes, there are a lot of names getting the shit kicked out of them. But if we look at the median stock in the S&P 500, mm. 
The median stock is 8% off its highs. That's nothing. So I no, guess the point me- is... Median. That's nothing. nothing. So if you were scared or worried yesterday, you are taking on way too much risk. And today you could sell something. <laughs> you could you could have sold it. Like if you were in pain yesterday, like in physical or mental anguish, today was your day to say, that was a close call. Let me make some changes because this could get worse and I don't want to go through that again. Do we want uh, to talk about like stocks peaking? You used to think stocks peaked in February? I don't well, know I want to show this. Yeah, I do. I do. I think that I think the raging bull market aspect of this bull market uh, peaked in February. JC agrees. JC actually puts data to it. I just use feelings like a Jedi. Um, but JC is saying late February, early March looks like a blow off top for a lot of speculative assets, which is not the same thing as saying the bull market's over. But here's what he's pointing out. Quote, uh, well, he was looking at the Dow down huge on rise of COVID cases. He's like, that's not what's going on. What's going on is stocks peaked in February and then confirmed that peak in March. NASDAQ new highs list peaked February 8th. NASDAQ advanced decline peaked the very next day, February 9th. Small caps and micro caps stopped going up at the same time. The IPO index put in a top in February. It's enough. Uh, I, we I have love these charts. I we have these charts. Hold okay, on. Okay, fine. No, he, Put up this he, IPO index versus the S&P 500, John. So this is like very obvious. It's not that IPOs were like got killed. It's just they stopped rising with the market probably because there were too many. One more. S&P versus IBD 50. John, you have that. So the IBD 50 is like ARC kind of, but it's like just much it's, more. Yeah, it's, mom- a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 50 best growth names. Yeah, it's very similar. It's earnings growth and stock price momentum in a basket. It's fairly well done. That peaked uh, right around the same time in February. And then in the meantime, treasury bonds might have their fourth straight up month. So that I, I feel like it's, it's not a stretch to say like the raging bull market ended four months ago and now There's we're one just more. in a different phase. There's one more. Uh, the SPAC, I, the, all the SPAC, you can look at the SPAC ETF or any of the SPACs, they also peaked. In February, so JC is right in the sense that maybe investor um, enthusiasm might have peaked before the market did, but so what? So, but what does that even mean? The stock market's three percent off its highs. What are we even saying here? What are the implications well, of that? Okay, so there's two implications to that. I'm so glad you asked. The first implication is that a lot of people who entered the market for the first time in the last 16 months, playing one game with a lot of success, are now forced to either wait for that game to start working again. Or it learn a new game. Or learn a new game. No, it's not. Yes, it the, is. I'm, I just went through this whole list of areas of the market that peaked four months ago and have not kept pace with the S and P. So that what? List well, is know, expanding. They're not, they're not buying and holding. What if they're What if they're now investing in Apple and Amazon and Facebook and all the other names that are? Oh, making I think they are. Homes. That's the point. They have had to learn a different game than buy fifty spac or you know buy ten spacs, ten IPOs. Automatic profits. That game ended. It was a great game. I think people wanna, did really well with that. You want to talk about the seasonality with the VIX stuff? Yeah, let's get into this re- very quickly. It actually makes sense for the volatility we saw this week to be taking hold just as it is. Uh, Nick Collis did this work at Data Trek. If you're very much into research, then Nick's product is as good as any. Uh, I love his stuff. We're looking at VIX seasonality, and he's showing us. Um, what July and August look like as a composite. So the blue line and the gray line uh, look almost identical, and orange is not that far off. And basically what Nick is saying is if the starting point is June 30th and the value is 100, we wrote that um, the VIX falls in early July, and then the first two to three weeks of, of 2021, July should be fine. And then you always see volatility rise into August. It has two peaks, one in early August, one in late August, which you can see clearly here. And he's basically like, look, this is not astrology. Like what I'm basically saying is there is some seasonal pattern to people not spending a lot of time in front of their computer screens trading in July and August. Like I don't think he's saying this is cosmic. Right. It's, it's behavior. It's people. Right. right. Um, last thing on this. I know we've been going on about this a lot. Uh, history says we have one to three more weeks of volatility ahead of us, likely lower stock prices as well. Um, 
and that stuff I'll throw out. The, I'll, I'll throw out. The you window. don't like. You don't like. There's not no, enough like of a that. sample size there. Well, it's okay. just like. So what, what do you do with that? I, I mean, listen. If you're like a trader, like certainly you want to be aware of that. As an investor, you don't. I don't pay attention to that. Well, what you do with that is say, oh, this makes sense. I get it. It happens all the time. Right. This right. time of year. So maybe back rather off. than panic. Maybe like instead of like trying to trade your way through this, you just like chill out. Yeah, yeah, dude. Do something else. Like you don't have to. You don't have to catch every move unless you really feel like you have to. In which case, you might be watching the wrong show. Okay. Right, let's let's keep moving. Let's talk about this. One of the first blog posts I did that I was very proud of. Was, actually, Dan Nathan gave me a shout out on CNBC. That was like a big deal for me in like 2014, I think, or so. I looked at a lot of the historical data because small caps were lagging the S&P. The Russell was lagging the S&P by a great deal. I think the S&P was at an all-time high and the Russell was like 10% off its so it was something like that. And people so, were right. like uh, people were like upset about it at the because time. Because I so, so I've been told by by people I, I suppose that you want to see the Russell you want to see small stocks confirming large large stock strength. Like if yeah. if the if the stock market is moving higher but the Russell's not participating, that's like some sort of bad omen or something. Turns out that's complete horseshit. Uh, Mark Holbert. <laughs> no way. Did, yeah, I know. Mark Holbert <laughs> did the study showing actually the exact opposite is true. That when the S&P 500 beats the Russell 2000 by more than 5% over a three-month period, returns going forward are very high. And the opposite, actually, you don't want to see small caps leading because when the Russell 2000 beats small, uh, large stocks by more than 5%, that's a bad thing. Now, we're looking at like 90-day periods, but still, this is the exact opposite of what I thought to be true. Um, the Russell, and, Hold on, last thing, last thing. The, why I mentioned that today, chart off, why I mentioned that today <laughs> is because <laughs> small caps look like shit relative to, the, to large caps. Well, people have been saying that for like a few weeks now, I feel like. Um, the, well, they, they have. People, yeah, when people say small caps don't look good, all they're saying is, is regional banks are down. Like it's not it's not like a brilliant insight. I also think most experienced or uh, let's say veteran investors understand that this doesn't actually matter. There's usually some sort of rev resolution, and in the bull market, what happens is the small caps catch up. So like that happened in 2016, very memorably after Trump's election, everybody bought the America focused companies, which are small caps, um, as opposed to multinationals. So like we, we know that that pattern typically resolves in a good way, not not a bad way. It's very rare that you go into a bear market. And the thing that people point back at is, you see, small caps were lagging. I told it's you like that. It's, it's, it's not the warning us. Not, it's not, it's just, you did not heed my warning. Thing. Wait, so two, two more things on this. So Callie Cox, we've been talking about the internals and divergences and all that stuff for a while, but the market is acting very, uh, very bizarre right now. Who Callie is Callie Co Cox? I feel like I know her. I think she works for Ally. She, I mean, she's been around. She, she does great stuff. She all tweeted right, yeah, yeah. 429 stocks in the S&P 500 declined while the S&P barely fell. That's the largest number of declines for a drop that small since at least 1996. So basically what she's saying is that market breadth is weird these days. And Jason Gepford from Sentiment Trader, who I, I reference his work all the time, had a great quote in the journal. And kudos to him because like this is his business. Um, and he said, we've been throwing up our hands for a while. For whatever the reason, the market is just rolling over all these historical indicators that before had a very consistent track record. Uh, yeah, that's, I respect him for giving that quote because it's like, it's very obvious that there's shit that's just never going back the way it used to be. And some of that has to do with new entrants in the market who don't behave like previous generations. Some of that is due to the nature of the crisis, the amount of liquidity that's out there right Fed, now. There are, like, yeah. there are like so many massive shifts that of course the data from previous years and decades shouldn't be relied upon to match up perfectly. And anyone that's playing the game that way just really needs a little bit more seasoning. Um, anyway, all right, shout out to Callie Cox. You were great on Friends. Who else did we show? Oh, Dan Nathan. So when he was um, shouting you out on TV, he was like, oh, Michael Batnick's got these really great charts. Yeah, check out Michael Batnick's blog. I love Dan Back Nathan. to you, Bill. Is that a good Dan Nathan? Not bad. Not bad. All right, shout out to Dan. Uh, what are we doing next? Uh, oh, Pershing Square's SPAC was the weirdest <clears throat> SPAC ever, which weird. makes perfect sense. I think um, 
we, you know, no disrespect to uh, Bill Ackman, but we talked about him thinking that or or joking that he he acts as though there are extra points for difficulty. Yeah, this in... was this was very convoluted. <laughs> we spoke about this a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, so it fell apart this week. I think the regulators were like, okay, whatever you're talking about is not actually a SPAC. You have the wrong vehicle for this. So what he wanted to do was buy 10%. Uh, stake in in uh, in the, the Universal Music Group, which is currently owned by Vivendi. Vivendi was about to spin that off onto an exchange in the Netherlands as its own stock or in Amsterdam. So in other words, Ackman would have pre-IPO stock and that wouldn't be all the money in his SPAC. He would keep the SPAC running like a closed-end fund. With The whole thing was very weird. It looks like he still wants to invest, so he's just moving that over to his, his hedge fund, that transaction where it belongs. And I think that resets the clock, so this Pershing Square Tontine thing has more time to start over and find a different deal. I'm not 100 percent sure what's going on there. Uh, Good me I either. Think, I have no, I have no idea what's going on. Well, that that's what's going on, and I, I feel like this is like a Matt Levine thing. Like for him to explain, he would explain it. it he would explain it in a very droll way. <laughs> so this is a quote: <laughs> extra the droll. The structure was hailed by some as a feat of financial engineering no. that also freed Mr. Ackman from some of the usual constraints. Some observers saw the structure as a concession to the reality. I mean, whatever. Okay. The whole thing Time is complete. The constraints yeah. are there. The constraints are the point right. of the vehicle. The investor protection is that if the shareholders don't like the deal, they get their cash back. Not, hey, let's turn this into an ETF and I'm just going to start buying stakes and shit. They're, so now the, what? There's a reason for those constraints, and if you don't like the constraints, do this in a different type of fund. So now what? Like, I, I told you, I think he gets. I think they restart the clock or something. He gets to try to find a different deal. Good luck. Um, so but, there, were, there was a uh, SPAC announced today. This company, Bolero, they own 321 bowling centers. Cool. That's eight short. times more than the next closest rival. How fast can I short it? Uh, two point six. Well, it's it's only two point six billion. So it sounds cheap. I don't I mean I don't know about the So this is 300 th This is where we are 300 bowling alleys in North America are worth 3 billion dollars. Uh, wait. <laughs> am I like sniffing rubber cement? Is that actually a deal that's about to happen? What's the pitch? Um like the bull, bull market in bowling? Have you ever seen a bowling alley where like you felt like this is the future. Like, have you been in a bowling so alley recently? Th there's there's stuff like this that is so dumb, and I think this stuff is really dangerous to the ordinary investor who sees shit like this and is like, "Top, I want to get off, stop the trade." And I totally get that. Like, I get that mentality, but that's been a really dangerous one for a long time. Yeah, I heard that shareholders get a free ashtray if they're in before the SPAC uh, converts. So it's a nice way to reward like the the customers and the shareholders. I don't really understand this. Is Bullmore Lanes part of this thing? The, the one in uh Oh, you know what's a cool bowling alley? I I fucked up. Um Brooklyn Bowl is actually really cool, but it's more like a concert venue uh, we've, than a bowling we've, alley. We've been there for times. That was fun. Yes, actually, can we just can we just cool. take a take a second? Let's just rewind because I for, we forgot to use a chart that I want to use. Eric Balchunas was kind enough to make this for me. The, the fixed income ETF. So we haven't. Even, we, we you you mentioned briefly that uh, bonds have gone off for four straight months. The amount of money coming into bonds is absurd, Duncan. We're talking one eight here. The, the uh, next one. That's the why amount, you got to hedge with bowling alley uh, ownership. That's obviously. not bad. That's but look at this. So this is an annual chart of fixed income ETF flows. So we are on track. Obviously, the year is about halfway done. Again, thank you, for Eric Balchunas, for making this work. We're going to make new all-time uh, highs for what are these, Mike. What are these numbers? So 0.2 million meets. I'm sorry, this is a little, this is a little messed up. It's 200 billion dollars. So two, so 200 billion dollars came in when? Like, what are the numbers on the bottom? This so is, those are annual. Those are annual flows. So this. So year to date, okay. we've had ha we've had 110 million, 110 billion. Excuse me, worth of flows at the fixed income ETFs. And I don't need to tell you where rates are. They're not this high. Is just, this is just a function of the money supply. I don't, so, but this – chart off. But this is everything. <laughs> this is yes, everything. I agree. Like the divergence that we're seeing between CPI and nominal interest rates, which usually track each other very closely, supply and demand for bonds is the most important thing. It's way more important than the fundamentals or inflation outlooks yes, or credit quality yes, or whatever. Yes, because it pushes, it pushes everybody else – 
out of those bonds that are yielding nothing into some other shit. So yes, this is the whole ball game. If you but, were the guy from It's Always Sunny with the conspiracy uh, chart behind you with the yarn connecting everything, what you just showed me would be at the center of it, obviously. But the only thing is that people, like we're getting pushed down on the risk curve, I guess, but people are buying a ton of bonds. They've never bought more bonds. Well, it's, well, so is it people? Because we had Rick Reader, we had Rick Reader on TV, and I basically shared a stat with him, and he's like, yeah, "Well, yeah, that's pretty much the whole thing," which is that sixty-four percent of all the money in the bond market is not economically positioned uh, money. That's exactly it's, my point. What is that? What's that? What's that? Stat, all right, by imagine. The way? All right, imagine you're a large pension fund, and because of the stock market rally. You are now in a better position than you've been in for two decades to meet your obligations. Wouldn't you take? Wouldn't you start pulling back on taking risk, knowing that? Yes. What happens when you do that? You buy fucking treasuries. Wait. So what's whether this, what's you want 60, to or not? What's that sixty-four percent stat? Sixty-four percent of the money in the treasury market is not traders placing interest rate oh, bets. Oh, is that from Allison Strager? Probably. It's like yeah, pension yeah. funds. Right, 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 fa- right, right. Uh, Foreigners are 25% of the treasury market. Their bonds are yielding negative numbers. You think they the give a shit about the... About the yeah. So, uh, so I think when you know that two-thirds of the bond market doesn't care and is right. not sensitive to the level of rates, we can stop right. trying to draw an economic prediction story from that, and we can start calling what it what it is, which is excess Manipulation. Liquidity. Manipulation. All right. All right. Uh, uh, let's, talk, let's talk about this Bitcoin breakdown. So I don't yeah. like have anything genius to add here. I'm certainly like not a Bitcoin expert. Um, but let's just uh, throw up a few charts here. Are you buying? Uh, I'm not buying any more Bitcoin. But more Ethereum. I'm Why full on stop? Bitcoin. Because you Why have too stop? much. You have too much personally, or are you making a call here? No, 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 no. I'm not making. No, if I if I didn't have as much Bitcoin as I did, I would I'd be buying. I don't want to have more than Ethe- I do. Ethereum is falling more than Bitcoin, and everybody keeps saying it's the the crypto of the summer. Apparently, it's not though. The crypto of the summer? What is that like? I don't a, know. What, what, what? I don't know. It looks like shit compared to Bitcoin. So, frankly. so Duncan, throw up this log chart if we got it. So I'm not saying like big deal because obviously, listen, if you bought at sixty thousand dollars, this feels pretty lousy. I'm only saying that like this is Bitcoin. This is what it does. Yeah. This is the most volatile asset on the planet. Wait, so what, is with- this, what is this chart? <laughs> this is making 63,000 look like it never happened? Because that's what happens when you scale. get 90, That's what happens when you get 90% declines. This is a log scale. So throw up the next chart showing percent off high. Bitcoin crashes. That's what it does. This is what uh, it does. Look at all those. Okay. You how many 50 you How many 51 you, drawdown? How many 51% drawdowns? Like in the it's, last five years, this looks like the sixth. You can't gain hundreds or thousands of percent in anything without getting your teeth kicked in sometimes. Like, I know that's like obvious, but come on. All right. The article said, what was the article that uh, $89 billion or $90 billion was wiped out of uh, crypto in the last couple of weeks? Or the last week or the something. The overall crypto complex is at the lowest level it's been, I think, since February. It's at like a tr- just over a trillion now. All right. So if you're one of these, if you're one of these guys that was running around with laser eyes on Twitter, four you better months be ago, Here you go. Uh, I I added, but I'm do- I'm doing it like automatically um, on Coinbase via DCA. I don't, this is great for me. What do, what do we what do we think? Like, a, what what's like the real real flush? I feel like twenty thousand would do it. That's like a seventy percent decline. I, yeah, I think like ETH one thousand, Bitcoin twenty thousand would be disastrous for pe- certain people because there's a lot of leverage here. But I think th- that leverage is what we're seeing, maybe being wrung out of the system. But well, I'm uh, here. I'm here for it. I feel like the faster it happens, the faster it'll be over with. I know that's like an obvious thing to say, but yeah, I, I agree. And look, I don't have a billion dollars worth of crypto, right. so every every time it gets killed is better for me if I if I continue to add to it. Um, if it goes to twenty, I will buy. I will buy some more. You'll buy some BTC at 20? Okay. I'll yeah. hold you to that. All right. Okay. Uh, what, where are we going next? Robin I know Hood. I always ask. It's right in front of me, right? So n- no big deal here. They filed on Monday. We think this deal is coming very soon. There were a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. The first is, are you surprised Vlad and the other co-founder really are 7.9% ownership each at this point? Like, I guess they've raised so much money during so Why, many you rounds. You think that's small? You think that's small? Yeah. No, but I don't I'm know not, if that's small for most founders for, coming public. 
first of all, $35 billion, they're okay. But in terms no, of- I agree. In terms of voting shares, they still hold like two thirds. I think they, they've got all the power. They st- right, so there's there's it's dual class, and and they're going to control this thing no matter what. So they, um, they they go, you know, they can do whatever they want with this company, pretty much. All right, so they're offering 55 million shares. They're trying to raise 2.3 billion. That's a pretty large deal. Um, 2.63 million of those shares are being offered by the founders and the CFO. Okay, I understand that. Um, so the proceeds from those aren't going to the company, but the rest will. They expect thirty-eight to forty-two as the IPO price. What are they going to do with that? Probably opens at seventy. What are they going to do with that? What are they going to do with what? The money? Yeah. Uh, pay pay all their fines and lawyers. Somebody had a good take uh, that I don't know if they can for legal reasons or whatever, but they should be they should have a sports betting business. I'm sure they will. I'm sure that I'm sure they could take it and buy anybody they want. They could buy a you know. Great Britain has like 50 of those companies running around that have been doing this for years. So, and I'm sure there are startups building apps just to sell them to Robinhood. I mean, I, I don't think that's I wonder why they did this them to enter. I wonder why they're doing a traditional IPO instead of a direct listing. Because they, they don't have as much cash as they would otherwise like. The reason you do a direct listing is because you just did a private market round and you're flush. But you think they need or- cash? They did a yeah. billion dollars. They did a billion dollars in revenue last year. Uh, how much would they just find? Seventy million. That's a lot of money. I mean, um, so so I know this is like apples. To I wasn't oranges. even joking, dude. I wasn't even joking with you. I think I think they're going to use a lot of this money to beef up compliance and pay off fines and pay lawyers and settlements. And I don't think they want to go through another cycle of that. Quite frankly, so this so I think we were people were talking about like a forty fifty billion dollar valuation. Now it's like thirty five. This is not apples to apples, but. So if they come public at thirty five billion, call it like thirty five times sales, they did a billion last year, or maybe that's last year. Let's all right. Let's just say it's a little bit lower. Let's call it if they grew. Let's say it's like twenty five times sales, whatever it is, something in that range. Square trades for nine times sales. PayPal fifteen. There's not like a ton of comparisons, but but where? But forget where they trade currently. Those are mature companies, or much further along toward being mature. Yeah. What like what do fintechs come out at generally on the IPO? Like what 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 what's a co- like what i don't SoFi? even know like what multiple sofi got bought for it's not a great comp but it's an, an obvious comp um so this is this is this is a, like a little sad trombone they're coming public probably six months after they should have yeah, yeah uh yeah. not that they could predict the future this is what they said this week quote we expect our revenue for the three months ending september 30th 2021 to be lower Compared to the three months ended June 30th, 2021, good, good. decreased levels of trading activity. Yeah, because good. I told you all this shit blew up in February. It's it done been over no, for a minute it. already. Stop. I'm telling you. Um, cryptocurrencies down has a huge impact on Robinhood's trading I don't, volume. I don't. I don't hope this happens. I don't hope this happens. But it would be kind of poetic if Robinhood coming public marks some sort of like short term top. I think they're past the top. My point is, could you imagine they were ready to go and came public in in January during meme stock mania? Could have been eighty billion. All right, would let's, have been a let's, way different deal. I just want so, to talk about Apple, Apple real quick. What? No, I'm saying sorry to Vlad. Uh-uh. Uh, no, they're I think, fine. I, I think you missed your window. You were a little past your window. Um, I feel like we spoke about this a, a few months ago. That the fact that this just blew my mind. The fact that I the iPad did more revenue. Last quarter than McDonald's. Like I, I mean, I'm still not. I think I'm still shook from this. Dude, the the iPad was like an essential product. It, it was not the just a COVID thing. It was not just a COVID thing. Well, I I understand it's a ten year old product, yeah. but I'm saying it became like you couldn't live without one, a, a surface like that in your house. I did. You know, I survived. Well, what do you have? Nine computers. I'm talking about like uh, kids. Kids needed iPads to do school. Um, anyhow, all right. So now Apple's got, dude, they've got a bond portfolio of $200 billion. That's sick. They're holding this all over the world, though, in different buckets. Some of it's probably in FX reserves meant to offset currency differences in the countries they're selling stuff. Like they, they have like legit currency risk, I think, also. So. Uh... One hundred ninety-five point five seven billion in cash right now. That's ridiculous. Morgan just texted this to me. 
Apple's Morgan Housel, Apple's unrealized gains on its bond portfolio is almost big enough to be an S&P component. Yo, tell Morgan I said what up. Did you hear that? The unrealized gains on their bond portfolio. Is big enough to be what? <laughs> it's almost big enough to be an S&P component. Just the gains that they would take if they were selling all of their bonds. So there was it's news today crazy. that they're going to be um, in the market for like 128,000 square feet in Los Angeles for movie stuff and okay. credit to them. So it's not like they're just letting the cash pile up. They've, they've distributed 200, a quarter of a trillion dollars in share yeah. in dividends and buybacks over the last five years. So they're trying to give the money back. They can't, they're making too much money and they haven't done anything they, stupid. Their biggest acquisition was beats that they're not like blowing money left and right. What do they do? What's their next move? If anything, uh, I just look, I, I don't, I'm not going to say don't spend the money developing shows, but their track record of doing that is not great. Um, I don't like, I don't think any, anyone's talking about this stuff. Like I almost feel like they'd just be better off buying somebody, but I don't know if there's anyone big enough left to buy. So, so I'm, not so, even talking, I'm not even talking about content. Like if you were hunting an act for an acquisition, make believe Peloton. that that's what I was going to say. Yeah, just do it. Somebody on the screen just said that. Uh, like they're already, they're already, I agree they're with already part time Larry. What build? <laughs> uh, Joel Dunlop, Apple Car. I agree with that too. That okay, probably that's probably takes five years. That probably takes five years to do. I don't think you just. I don't think you just build cars unless you're gonna like buy I got somebody. It. I got it. I got it. Home building. Just build ha Apple homes. Imagine uh, an Apple an, an i home. Sounds like a terrible business for them. It's asset heavy. They like asset light business. That's why, the, I was, that's that's why like the car joke. thing seems like they're going to have a partnership with Hyundai or somebody that knows how to build stuff. I don't. I don't think they want to start building oh, cars. Oh, this is this is small potatoes. But did they you see build, they, they don't even build phones. This is small so. potatoes. They announced the buy now pay later partnership with with Goldman. I think that makes sense. If you could buy a two thousand dollar computer over a ten month, well, whatever. Who cares? All right, let's move on. Sure. They they have too much money. They're running out of things to do with it. I don't think Tim Cook's looking to get into a rocket. Like I don't I don't really know. But they just the last point on this. We have these arguments like buybacks, no dividends, no R and D, no capex. How about all? Apple literally does it all, like in huge numbers. And, and they're I spending they, like tens of billions of dollars in, in and all hiring stuff. Yeah, and yeah, creating yeah. jobs, like everything you could want a company to do, they do. By the so way, I think it's very impressive. We didn't mention like Bezos to the to the wherever he went. I mean, that that was pretty cool. That gave me chills. I was into it. I watched it. I don't really like that stuff. I like sci-fi. I don't like science reality. I don't think I've watched a rocket launch in a long time. That was so cool. Really cool. And the presentation was cool. They like had people who worked on the rocket as the color commentators. They had cameras in all the right angles to capture all the, the, the whole moment. The parachutes were like color coordinated. I thought the cowboy hats were super dope. I got to get one of those next time I'm in Texas. I love everything. No, I shouldn't. I love everything about that launch today. And I feel like that's in another example of private enterprise doing a better job than government. Cause I don't think, Anything NASA's done in the last 20 years has been particularly exciting to casual uh, viewers. Okay, where's my boy? Bring him in. Duncan there Hive, activate. Hey, guys. What's up, man? <laughs> did, we, did you watch the space thing or what? I did. I did. What'd you, yeah. what'd you think? I enjoyed it. I, I think I kind of liked the Virgin Galactic launch a little better, though, as far as the overall coverage and stuff. How come that Why? fell short? I feel like I didn't even watch that one. Yeah, I, I didn't know. see it. I, I think for me, I mean... Richard Branson's kind of like a more fun character than Jeff Bezos. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's kind of why I was watching it. I've watched all of them. I watched the like um, the SpaceX ones and all that kind of stuff too. So you you are into that stuff. So this yeah, was I mean, perfect not for like you. Crazy into it, but yeah, I'm I'm into it. Dude, did you see the part when the shuttle when when they were falling at like two or three thousand miles an hour? I like my heart was fluttering. I can't I can't handle that. I can't even picture that. I don't even mind the going up that fast. The the falling part before the shoots started to get deployed yeah, was I way too much for me. I don't trust parachutes that much. I don't yeah, like I, that. I couldn't handle that part. All right, but we're we're glad that it worked and and uh, we're glad that everybody made it back. The story with uh, Wally Funk was awesome, and I didn't really know anything about that story, so I think everybody was happy with the way today went, except for probably eighty fools on Twitter. Um, but I think <laughs> most people in the world are like, okay, that was pretty cool. 
Um, all right, cool. what, do you, what do you got for us, Duncan? Okay, so first up, uh, we have a question from JT who asks, is Josh ever short? Do you ever recommend hedging or buying protective puts, or do you just recommend people continue to dollar ca- cost average during downtimes? Uh, and they ask kind of in the context of even even someone who's a do it uh, do it yourself kind of investor with a large portfolio. Yeah. All right. So a couple of things on this. No, I don't short individual stocks. I have too much respect for the work being done by people like uh, Jim Chanos and Carson Block and people that like really do the work and have high conviction and follow these stories and relentlessly pursue what's really going on with these companies and take shit from the media and get sued and get visited by the FBI. Like I have way too much respect for the people that are really doing that to like walk in and like be, be like a casual short sell. I just don't, I don't have that expertise, that personality, uh, that, that knowledge base. So it's very far from my area. Uh, the good news is I don't think it's necessary for most investors, nor are protective puts. I think pick the amount of money that you want to have at risk, and that's it. Don't risk more just so you can hedge some of it back. And I know that's controversial, and I know a lot of people make their living telling people they should trade options. No disrespect. It's just not how I do it. The last part of that is, for me personally, I try to do as much of my individual stocks in a tax-deferred account as I can. And so, de facto, I can't short or engage in put-buying uh, in in an IRA, a SEP IRA, a Roth IRA. So it's just not. It's not. I don't think it's good or bad. It's just not for me. So I hope I'm I'm getting that across well. Mike, how did I do? I just shorted the S and P in size, just in case. <laughs> Yesterday. Yeah, I should add. They asked what Mortimer thought as well. So they obviously were watching last no, week. No, I I started I started my <laughs> trading career. Mike by just shorted my portfolio banks. In, in size. You know, yeah, but, I, you I, but, but you know you don't know what you're doing. Like of you're not, not. You're not a short seller. No, no. Sh- oh, that's no like shit. a real thing that we are not. So no, you can't make believe. I mean, you can't. No believe. doubt. All right, but next question. Much respect to the people that do that for real. It's not us. Okay, so uh, the next one comes from uh, someone who just put E, um, and so uh, they ask uh, Michael about career advice. Basically, they say my origin story is a lot like Batnick's being forced to sell insurance products to fin- friends and family. It's awful and has put a really bad taste in my mouth. Any tips for someone with security licenses who doesn't consider themselves a salesman? Uh, and I'll, I'll also mention they say that they have a degree in math and statistics um, to fall back on. But, uh, but uh, yeah. All right, so shout out to Eric from Northwest Mutual. Just ga- I'm just guessing. I don't know that for sure. Uh, Duncan will not reveal that to me. Uh, I don't know. Mike, you, you take that. Okay. So I, I felt the exact same way. Like sales is not for me. It probably isn't, but it's it's like really hard to sell a product you don't believe in. So just because you weren't successful selling fucking garbage doesn't mean that you can't be successful selling something that actually has value to people. So I mean you might you might not be a salesman at all. That might be the case, but um, I wouldn't discount your ability just because you didn't like just because you failed out is what they call it of the insurance industry. Yeah, I I think uh, I I think it's really really hard to be in the securities business, not be a banker or a trader, and think that whatever role you have is not going to involve sales. Like it usually is, but maybe the best way is to make sure you're not at an insurance company. Like to well, begin also, with. even if you're not selling a product or a service to an end user or client, you're you still to have advisors. to have the you still have to have the ability to sell yourself. Yeah. Why should an employee hire you? Like, Josh, I sold myself pretty good to you, right? I, I put a gun to your head and I said, hire me. Oh, yeah. No, you were you were impeccably dressed and you just nailed the interview. <laughs> um, I agree. Everybody on Wall Street is selling something. Very often they're selling themselves. I, I guess I would just say, like, get used to it. Unless you're a quant and then you just have to sell yourself to Cliff Asness and get a job there. But, like, if you're if you're not a genius – you're probably going to be selling something to somebody. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if you don't like it, if it's not a good match with your personality, it's good that you're figuring that out early. Okay, what else? Uh, okay, so last thing, we just have a, a quick question from a, a big fan named Charles who wants to know if you have any plans to narrate uh, the <laughs> audio version of Backstage Wall Street, Josh. 
Oh, no, no, no. Uh, th- first of all, Charles, thank you so much. I don't think there's a lot of demand for that sort of thing. Not that a lot rock, of people. That, are... that rocket ship has sailed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's an eight-year-old book, and not a lot of people want 12 hours of my voice. So there's not a, a ton of demand there. It's However, I have just committed... I have just committed to being a part of a uh, uh, a coming documentary. I don't think I'm allowed to say what streaming service or network it's probably coming out at. I know I said I'm saying no to all these things. I decided to say yes to one. So look for me in that, I guess. And it won't be about back, backstage Wall Street, but it will be about Wall Street. And maybe that'll scratch the itch. All right. That's all I got on that. Duncan, you are... Uh, dismissed, my friend. Once again, guys, make sure that you're sending us your topics for the show. Ask the compound show at gmail.com. We love them. They're so good. We have so many of them saved up, and we try to get to them whenever we can. Uh, make sure you check out the compound and friends later this week. It goes live Friday morning. Before that, tomorrow morning, brand new animal spirits with Michael and Ben. Hit the compound shop, I don't shop.com, for the latest in fashion, coming from your favorite financial bloggers. Hit the like button for the algo. Subscribe to the channel. We will see you next week. Thank you so much, guys.